Mac Miller was a producer, rapper, writer, and a singer who was respected by the world of musicians and loved by millions of fans. Because Mac didn't just use his talents to create catchy, safe pop songs. He made a world of sound around the chaotic experience of being a young artist thrown into fame. His music explored sadness, isolation, and addiction at the same time as he climbed the ranks and became a star. And his ability to play every role in the music production process gave his songs a vivid, colorful feeling. Because he didn't only make songs expressing his struggles. He also made romantic R&B ballads, slow, smooth jazz, and true hip-hop bangers. Mac Miller was a true artist, and it shows in the seemingly endless amount of mixtapes, side projects, albums, singles, and unreleased work he made throughout his career, all of which are beautiful windows deep into his soul. So let's get into the story of Mac Miller and figure out what made him such a legendary artist. If you're interested in more of my creations, I just launched the spirit of creativity that I started by myself with the mission of telling a true story, reminding artists, musicians, and creators everywhere to just keep moving forward and chase your dreams no matter what. So go to volksgeist.store to get $10 off the spirit of creativity for the next week and free shipping in the US forever. Shipping begins in late December. Malcolm McCormick was born in the Point Breeze neighborhood of Pittsburgh in the winter of 1992. His father was an architect and his mother was a photographer. So being raised by two artists, it's not a huge surprise he turned out to be one himself. When Mac was introduced to the guitar at the age of six, his lifelong love of music began. And from a young age, he taught himself how to play every instrument he could get his hands on. Drums, piano, bass, his thirst for learning was was unstoppable even when he was a kid. But once he entered high school, he was exposed to hip hop and the desire to succeed as a rapper became his number one goal. In one of Mac's first ever interviews from 2010 when he was 18 years old, he said this, I used to be into sports and go to all the high school parties. But once I found out that hip hop is almost like a job, that's all I did. In the same interview, they wrote that Mac's first mixtape, which he called Horrible, sold about 70 copies, but his next project was downloaded 30,000 times online and it caused him to miss class at high school so much that he almost didn't graduate from how often he was getting booked for concerts from the popularity of that project. He released six mixtapes before his first studio album, and he was growing a pretty big fan base, but critics kind of hated him. It was common for Mac to be called immature, douchey, corny, cheesy, untalented, and bland. Girl, map quest my address to access my mattress. I get girls straight out the, the pageant. No doubt that I'm smashing, I'm asking her name. Types of cheese in the sheets, we have dessert until it hurts. Feeling on her curves. I tear the board that pussy till it purrs. Touch me. But but at the same time, Mac's fan base just kept growing because he was making what was cool and fun for him and his own life experience. Mac was actually so true to himself early on that when he first started getting big offers from major labels to sign with them, he decided instead to go with Rostrum, a completely independent record label that was much smaller than some of the other companies he could have worked with. Rostrum was based in his hometown and they were already associated with Wiz Khalifa, another Pittsburgh rapper that Mac looked up to as a mentor at the time. Mac Miller's best known mixtape, Kids, is a perfect example of what people both liked and didn't like about Mac at the time. Songs like Senior Skip Day have these ridiculously light pop rap beats, and it's just Mac rapping about eating food, drinking, skipping school, messing around with girls. And, you know, people were like, who the hell is this for? Is he trying to rap about the dumbest things possible? Is he trying to be as bland and shallow as he can possibly be? It was silly to the point of being stupid. But Mac's audience just kept growing thanks to the popularity of the frat rap subgenre, which despite being hated by almost everyone else, still had enough fans in the college demographic to make Mac Miller a rising star. Despite the immaturity of a lot of the songs on the kids mixtape, there are some real standout tracks like The Spins, Knock Knock, and Face in the Crowd. Wanna get a mansion, a jacuzzi, a theater to watch my movies, couple whips and lots of fancy things, the kids they call the goonies. I see the future, crystal ball, mirror, mirror hanging on the wall, who the flies, white boy, you're the mall. That hint at Mac's future interest in jazzy beats, singing, experimentation, and existential songwriting. Don't you feel good? Don't you feel great? I feel so fly and I hope you can relate. Got some brand new shoes and a brand new tee. It's the same old dude with a brand new me. And then shortly after, Mac Miller's breakout hit was Donald Trump, which went viral on YouTube, garnering 20 million views in just two months. Take over the world when I'm on my Donald Trump shit. 
get all this money? Ain't that some we shit? We gon' take over hey. the world while these haters getting mad. That's why all my bitches bad. They see this crazy life I have and they ain't all. We gon' win. You can take the loser. The song charted on the Billboard Hot 100 and eventually went platinum. It catapulted Mac into the public consciousness and solidified his position as one of the biggest rappers on social media during a time when the music industry wasn't yet closely linked with platforms like YouTube and Facebook. So when Mac dropped his first studio album, it ended up being the first independently released record to debut at number one on the Billboard charts in 16 years with no features, but he still wasn't beating the untalented allegations. I mean, look, Blue Slide Park wasn't terrible, but aside from a few banger songs like Missed Calls and Smile Back, it's not anything really special. It's just pretty standard frat rap. And once you start, don't take no breaks. Work until I get it. I bet it's gonna take a second. But once I start up my engine, I'm gone. Too fast to catch him. I'm landing mixed up with UGK. Maybe try to purple drink. What I'm on is strong. Yours, we could accept. That being said, though, the music industry and the community absolutely ripped Mac apart even worse than when he had been a more underground artist. And the consensus was that Blue Slide Park was annoying at best and garbage at worst. Pitchfork famously wrote an insanely negative review of this record, rating it a one out of 10. They wrote all sorts of crazy commentary on Mac, like forget Eminem, Mac Miller's point of view is less unique than Asher Roth or Childish Gambino. These are two other kind of frat rap style artists who were pretty popular at the time. He lusts after fame, money, and women. He smokes weed and he parties. Obviously, Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that, it is rap music, but it does raise the question of why Miller is so popular. Because despite his claim of being a cross between John Lennon and UGK, he's mostly just a crushingly bland, intolerable version of Wiz Khalifa, without the chops, the desire, or the pocketbook for enjoyable singles. It was rough, but it didn't even stop there. He was a white frat rapper from a nice neighborhood in Pittsburgh. His music wasn't that interesting or complex, and he hadn't made anything good enough so far to make people take him seriously. But looking back now, I think Blue Slide Park isn't bad enough to have warranted the reaction it did at the time, and it seems almost like Mac took the heat for not just himself, but also all the other frat rappers, simply because he was the one who got the most popular doing it. But Mac Miller didn't disappear or fall off or argue with the critics after the negative reception of Blue Slide Park. Instead, he took the criticism seriously. He embraced his true talent for music, which he had been developing since he was a kid, and he created a new sound that was more authentic emotionally mature and musically interesting. So in between Blue Slide Park and his next record, Mac put out a few side projects, one of which was Macadelic, a mixtape he made in just a few months with a rather confused sound. Mac obviously didn't quite know what to do at this point. He was only 19 years old, but also one of the most successful young rappers in the industry. And the entire world hated his music at the same time. So Macadelic has abstract sounds, but also features from Lil Wayne, Juicy J, and Cameron. It's a very strange middle ground between frat rap and introspective hip hop storytelling. Fight the Feeling is one of my favorite songs by Mac Miller. It features Kendrick Lamar and Iman Omari, with Mac rapping about the weight of his success and the instability of his career over a melancholic beat. When you were young and you just trying to live your life and have some fun in a world where you have yet to see how evil it's become. It's hard to have a dream when you deep inside of one and I know you hate them spirits so I keep them in my lungs. I'm a and that's what made Macadelic a really special project. Mac Miller didn't become bitter and go into his shell he ended up opening up more and allowing people deeper into his world, becoming more relatable and honest at the same time. In 2012, while he was hard at work on his official return after Blue Slide Park, he unofficially dropped a song under another alter ego, Larry Fisherman, that to this day is one of the darkest, most introspective songs he's ever made, and a huge departure from anything he ever made before. Mac completely opened up on this song. The way that Mac raps about the pressure of having so much negative attention on him offers an unmatched level of honesty for almost any artist I've ever heard. The song is unpolished, it's rough, it's basically a demo, but it's truly amazing. I wish life was kind of easier to figure out. I wish it was like Ferris Bueller singing twist and shout. I got a couple reasons that I'll stick around, but for the most part this shit is foul. I place my hand on the stove top to see if I'm awake. I heard you taking bath salts and eating people's face. It shows a window into Mac Miller's soul that's amazingly deep and clear, especially for an artist who was only 20 years old when he wrote it. The old Mac Miller was disappearing, and a new one with more weight on his shoulders and more to say was growing back. Watching movies with the sound off was Mac's second studio record. It was dropped shortly after doodling in the key of C sharp in the spring of 2013, 
and it was another big step forward. As part of growing and getting to the next stage with his creativity and his art, he made his own path and found his own sound. He took the lead in developing the entire project. There's also a long list of artists who helped shape the record's sound. Producers like Flying Lotus, The Alchemist, Clams Casino, Pharrell, they all contributed to help create the aesthetic Mac was looking for. Artists like Earl Sweatshirt, Action Bronson, Schoolboy Q, Ab Soul, they featured on the songs. Avian is a light, airy track with a piano loop that feels like you're walking through a flower garden. There's a bird in the sky. Look at him fly. Why? Pharrell produced Objects in the Mirror, a quiet, jazzy song with soft roads, keys, jungle sounds in the mix, and distant electric guitar notes. People love you when they own your mind. But that is love's currency. And I've been thinking about her all the time. I never seen somebody put together perfectly. Watching movies with the sound off ended up being a major crossroads in Mac's career. It was a whole new sound from Blue Slide Park, which was nuked out of orbit by critics. And sure, it was the direction he wanted to go in, but it wasn't really clear if Mac's new thoughtful sound would be received well by anybody. A full studio album of introspective philosophical writing and jazzy production, it was a risk. But the risk ended up totally paying off. Watching movies with the sound off was the moment that Mac Miller proved he was worth taking seriously, and he had done something undeniably interesting in the world of music. Even though it didn't chart at number one or have a big hit single, Mac's clout and respect as a real artist was starting to grow. Halfway through recording watching movies with the sound off, Mac Miller moved from his home in Pittsburgh to a house in Studio City, LA. In this house, he had a home recording studio that he named The Sanctuary, and it became a free creative environment for everybody who visited, and a lot of people visited. This is a big part of how Mac became such a well-respected musician over the years. He made good friends with Odd Future and Tyler the Creator, Earl Sweatshirt and Vince Staples. There were regular visitors, even Schoolboy Q, Ab Soul, and Kendrick Lamar always came around. One person who visited said you could spend 72 hours in The Sanctuary and think it's still the same day. You would come in during the day and you would come out at night, but there was always something to get done and it pushed everybody. Mac Miller ended up only having the studio for a year, but this is also where he recorded Faces, a mixtape that a lot of people, myself included, feel is one of the greatest projects he ever made. At this point in his career around 2014, Mac was in the middle of doing a 180 in his public perception. He had separated from the immature sound that defined his early career, and he had made multiple beloved projects full of diverse musical sounds. With a discography as big as Max, it's hard to choose a favorite project, but Faces is easily in my top three. On Rate Your Music, they have it ranked as the second best mixtape ever with over 8,000 ratings. Faces was made without a label, but it's truly a special project. Jazzy production, a narrative that revolves around loneliness, drugs, mortality, it's a masterpiece. Mac's ability to create an expansive universe of sound by producing the majority of the project himself with help from Earl Sweatshirt, Thundercat, and more, it truly makes Faces come to life. And there are jazz samples all over Faces. Diablo samples the beautiful intro to In a Sentimental Mood by Duke Ellington and John Coltrane to create a truly fun, bouncy beat that Mac rides with a great flow. It's the rap Diablo, macho when I drop flows. Bar gets raised up, it's me and Petey Pablo. Colder than gazpacho, colder than the mono. Rapping head honcho, rocking shows like I was Bono. I go. Friends samples Miles Davis's The Ghetto Walk, using a bass lick from the intro as the foundation to a loping jazz beat with a ton of different vocal samples and sound effects from Mac. The song feels textured, it's almost alive, as Mac's ad-libs fill the song with comedic energy. Don't make no sense. I know the planet Earth is about to explode. Kinda hope that no one save it. We only grow from anguish. Colors and Shapes is a really calming, psychedelic song that might be Mac's best ever. He sings about the experience of being on LSD, and it makes you feel like you're floating through the production. The sounds rise and fall with the flow of the melody, the atmosphere is colorful. If it was colors and shapes, the imaginary, instead of all of this weight that we have to carry, would you be able to bring? 
Mac basically locked himself in the sanctuary to make faces. His friends even said that they had to pry him out of the studio with a crowbar to get him to leave. This was a big contrast from the previous few years where he had done 100 or 200 shows every single year. But ultimately, Faces was a musical diary of where Mac was in life at the time, and he wasn't in a great place. The long days and nights at the sanctuary, the constant drug use, hallucinations, his fixation on death, knowing it was the logical conclusion to the lifestyle he was leading. But despite all of that, Faces has a kind of lively, energetic feel through a lot of the songs, and it reminds me that even when Mac was down, even when he was existentially desperate, sad, depressed, isolated, he still stayed up as best as he could. He was still always optimistic. In 2017, he tweeted, I was not on this earth when I made Faces. Nowhere close. And despite how beautiful Faces was, Mac reached a point where he could no longer sustain the lifestyle that inspired it. He eventually ended up living near Rick Rubin for a month to help him come down and reorganize his mind. During a later interview, he said this, Rick Rubin was someone that was really instrumental in helping me get to a better place. I didn't go to rehab, I just went to Rick Rubin's house. With a refreshed perspective, a better attitude, and a year-long break, Mac dropped Good AM in 2015, a much more optimistic and lively project than the dark existentialism on Faces. The production is clean and polished and full of bombastic pop songs like Brand Name, 100 Grandkids, Cut the Check, but there are still some darker, more reflective tracks as well, like the seven minute long, Perfect Circle slash Godspeed and Ascension. To everyone who sell me drugs, don't mix it with that bullshit. I'm hoping not to join the 27 Club. Just want the coke, build our house with the velvet rug. Fuck the world, it's no one else but us. Perfect Circle slash Godspeed is a darker song about Mac's ego. It's truly one of the best tracks Mac ever made, where he freely admits to and almost brags about his drug addiction, while ignoring the damage it's doing to him and the people close to him. I'm a buffalo soldier, heaven is a mile away to trouble much closer. I'm only 23, but my mind is older and it'll forever be. Dead presidents to the homies, dead to my enemies. But halfway through the song, a voicemail from his brother plays as a wake-up call and Godspeed starts. It has a light beat and a vocalist follows the melody as Mac raps about how ridiculously bad his addictions truly are and he knows he has to stop before it eventually kills him. I need to wake up before one morning I don't wake up. You make your mistakes, your mistakes never make you. I'm too obsessed with going down is a great one. But if you wait too long, they gonna find someone to replace you. The production is gorgeous, but the writing is heartbreaking. Good AM is a solid album. It's pretty poppy, pretty mainstream, but it's not one I personally go back to all that much. Mac didn't have a lot of production credits on this record, and while the beats are good, they do feel pretty popular, pretty excitable. It doesn't have that jazzy, psychedelic feeling that makes Mac's best work his best work. I think a lot of his great work came from stuff that he produced himself or directed himself, and this is missing that. I do appreciate the happier, brighter tone of the album, and I like that he showed he doesn't need to rap about lonely and isolation to make good music, and for that, Good AM is a really solid project. All the way back in 2012, Mac Miller and Ariana Grande became friends when they did a cover of Baby It's Cold Outside under his Larry Lovestein alter ego. They stayed in contact and had a handful of collaborations until 2016 when they first publicly appeared as a couple. This relationship had a significant influence on the rest of Mac's life and all of the music he dropped from this point on. The Divine Feminine, which was Mac's fourth album, is heavily associated with the story of their relationship. Even though a lot of it was written before they were together, Ariana Grande definitely left a mark on this era of Mac's career. It shows a big change in the tone from Mac's previous project. It has a funkier, more optimistic, lighthearted, soulful sound, and a narrative revolving around love and romance. The Divine Feminine overall is a lot more cohesive and consistent than Mac's previous projects that ranged from hip hop to existential to fun bangers. The Divine Feminine has a soulful, jazzy, upbeat sound, and it maintains a loving, pure theme throughout. The opening track, Congratulations, has an intimate feel. Ariana Grande can be heard whispering, laughing, singing, and then it's followed by a soft, delicate piano melody. Baby, you were everything. 
thing I ever wanted Bought a wedding ring, it's in my pocket Planned to ask the other day, knew you'd run away So I guess I just forgot it Remember when you went away to college? I was on the phone, we end up talking Past, present, future, all the guys She also makes an appearance on My Favorite Part Adding vocals to the groovy bass and clapping percussion Skin is another great song with long sections of jazz and synth And the album concludes with God is Fair, Sexy and Nasty An 8 minute long complex jazz rap song featuring Kendrick Lamar Followed by Max grandmother expressing love for her husband in a vocal sample. It does require a specific mood to appreciate the vibes of the Divine Feminine, but it also shows a ton of growth and focus from Mac when so many of his albums before had been kind of a mess of sounds. After the Divine Feminine, Mac Miller had become so respected as an artist that it might be easier to list the people who he wasn't friends with. His studios were famous for having an open door policy. Artists could walk in and work anytime, and countless artists took him up on that. Mac and Earl Sweatshirt had been close friends since 2013. They produced and featured on a lot of each other's songs. Catch him in the daytime of dusk hours, smoking out the pound, how the mutts out it. If your tuck's lousy, then you can't sit with us. Nah. Can't call it harsh living when the margin. Mac even became good friends with Mac DeMarco to the point where Mac DeMarco actually wrote one of his best and most heartbreaking songs, Heart to Heart, about Mac Miller. You can even hear a sample of Mac's laughter in the last few seconds of the track. Heart to heart. Mac was very close with Thundercat. They held birthday parties for Thundercat's daughter at Mac's studio, and they collaborated many times over the course of his career. During an interview, Thundercat said this about Mac Miller. He said, Mac changed my life and he was one of my best friends. I just know he's always here with me and I keep him in my heart. Thundercat even canceled a few shows during his tour of Europe to fly home and play at Mac's Tiny Desk concert in 2018. It ended up having over 100 million views on YouTube and arguably became the most famous Tiny Desk concert NPR ever did. That's how much respect Mac's friends had for his creativity and pure connection with music people would drop everything to work with him because they trusted his vision. Another legendary artist who appreciated Mac Miller was Kendrick Lamar. He called him a great musician and a great writer. And then all in all, that's the type of person he was, just a good dude, always made you feel good, just a great energy to have around. He'll pull up to the studio, give honest opinions. I play music, he said, I like that. You should do something right here, or uh, just whatever, man. And he was just true and selfless about it. And um, great musician great writer, uh, just always had a smile on his face, and that's something that I commend. Uh, no matter what he was going through, he didn't make you feel sorry for him. He was strong about it. I always kept a smile on his face because he wanted you to smile too. It wasn't no misery loves company with him, you know? He showed a smile and you gave that smile right back and made you feel good. Swimming, which dropped in August of 2018, represents the culmination of Mac's career growth over the past six years and a million projects. Swimming explores themes of loneliness, addiction, and personal failures, while also focusing on self-love, growth, optimism. It's a reflection of the balance between darkness and light that Mac always struggled with in his heart. There's an emphasis in the storytelling on his newfound sense of hope and the influence of his relationship with Ariana Grande during the album's production, even though they broke up shortly before it was released. On Swimming, Mac seems like he had been wandering around in the darkness for a long time, but was finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. During an interview, he said he was truly trying to find balance. The record begins with Come Back to Earth, which serves as a calm introduction, and in this song, Mac sings about the value of life despite its challenges and how he has been able to find a balance between struggle and happiness. Self-Care ended up being one of Mac's most popular songs. The first half of this track features psychedelic synths and a cloudy beat, but the writing is what truly shines. In this section, he passionately raps about recognizing his flaws and persevering through them to find meaningful self-love. Halfway through the song, though, the beat switches to a more weightless sound, accompanied by dreamy, ambient synths. Mac's storytelling takes on a comforting tone, as if he's finally found the self-love he was seeking. I got all the time in the world, 
So for now I'm just chilling Plus I know it's a, it's a beautiful feeling In oblivion, yeah, yeah the song 2009 is based on a gorgeous strings arrangement. Mac reflects on his career since the release of his mixtape Kids, reminiscing about when his life was simpler and happier. He also accepts that his life now is much fuller, and the struggles he went through ultimately made him a better person. Okay, you gotta jump in the swim. Well, the light was dim and this light was sin. Now every day I wake up and breathe. I don't have it all, but that's all right with me. Take the final song on the album, So It Goes, is a bouncy and melancholic track named after a line from the book Slaughterhouse Five. In the book, Kurt Vonnegut writes, So It Goes, every time someone dies, symbolizing acceptance. This song represents the last stage of acceptance in Mac's journey, trying to accept life's problems and embrace the necessity that you have to keep moving forward. It's truly one of my favorite outro tracks ever. You could have the world in the palm of your hands, you still might drop it. And everybody want to reach inside your pockets. I tell them red light. Stop it, shit, that give me more headaches than alcoholics. There was no and in the end, swimming is a pivotal moment in Mac's journey as an artist and a person. This album is him trying to stand on the idea that it's okay to feel lonely, it's okay to be isolated and sad and down and take losses, but it's not okay to stagnate or fall in love with your own misery. He was truly trying to tap into a meaningful sense of acceptance of trouble, a stoic outlook that the only way to move forward is to just keep going. Swimming was Mac's way of letting us know that everything was going to be okay, and you can hear him trying to convince himself of that idea throughout the whole record. But a month after dropping Swimming, on September 7, 2018, Mac Miller passed away at his house in Studio City in LA. He was supposed to shoot a music video the same day. He had a tour that was planned to start the next month. He died from accidentally overdosing on laced drugs. In a way, Mac predicted his own death on the song Brand Name from Good AM back in 2015. The only thing is, it was even more tragic. He didn't join the 27 Club because he was only 26 when he died. It's impossible to overstate the impact that Mac Miller's death had on the music industry. Mac was respected by so many artists during his career that when his friends and his collaborators held a tribute concert in his memory, the number of people who came to show respect and perform was endless. Anderson Pack, Miguel, Earl Sweatshirt, John Mayer, Travis Scott, SZA, Thundercat, Schoolboy Q, JID, Vince Staples, Action Bronson, Ty Dollar Sign, all of these people came to celebrate their friend and his life. The love that other artists had for Mac Miller was truly unique. After Mac's death, it felt like the beautiful journey journey of swimming might be the last we would ever hear of Mac's music. But fortunately, even to this day, his amazing family is dedicated to continuing his legacy in the best way they can. And his final studio album, Circles, was released after his death in January of 2020. He wrote Swimming and Circles at the same time, so Circles was somewhat completed when Mac passed. But the producer John Bryan, who had worked closely with Mac during the making of these albums, he finished the record based on the existing material they had. Despite not being finished by Mac himself, Circles shows that Mac was approaching his creative peak. Every song on Circles is beautiful and unique in its own way. They're all filled to the brim with deep emotion and storytelling, like the slow, loving simplicity of Surf, the melancholy, bittersweet good news, or the pondering introspection of Complicated. It's a truly amazing record. Looking inward is a big theme on Circles. Mac again looks inside himself, trying to figure out why he feels the way he does, why his life is the way it is. He's trying to make a reason for all the trials and the struggles he seems to be stuck in. On Swimming, he reached a point of balance in his life, and he expresses this with enthusiasm. And I think Circles is very similar, but much mellower. The production is soft and relaxing, and the tone of his writing is a little bit more calm. The intro track Circles is a melancholy song with melodic bass, twinkling synths. Max sings about being stuck in place, not being able to change despite so many attempts. Like so many of the other songs on Circles, it feels like its own world. The atmosphere is so strong that when the song ends, I feel like I've just woken up from a dream. Well, I drink my whiskey, you sip your wine. We're through while sitting watching the world falling down is the climb. 
Blue World begins with a barbershop quartet sample, which turns into a trippy syncopated beat, and it's probably the most upbeat song on Circles. Mac raps for one of the only times on the record, talking about how he remains happy despite the crazy world he lives in. The song Good News is beautiful as it rides the line between melancholy and hopeful, with Mac singing about how all he wants is to be happy, but he keeps getting in his own way. I believe this was the first single released after Mac's death, and the first time I heard it, I'm not gonna lie, I couldn't stop myself from crying. There are a lot of songs on here with Mac talking about his coping mechanisms, trying to reach an optimistic state of mind, trying to grow in life, trying to accept his flaws and not let them hold him back from being good to himself. And one of the best tracks on the record with this theme is Surf. The song is a metaphor for growing, accepting your flaws, and all these other themes that Mac just kept going back to. Eventually, he ends the song singing one of my favorite verses he ever wrote. Circles might be my favorite ever Mac Miller album. It feels like it has the beauty, the complexity, and the depth of faces with the hopeful optimism of swimming in its own calming way. Because when I listen to Circles, I don't get the feeling that Mac was making sad music just to make sad music. The sad songs aren't emo. They're bittersweet, and melancholy, but they're always looking up. Despite the handful of truly dark songs and verses Mac made, throughout his career, he maintained a consistent theme of trying to be hopeful. It's sad because we hear Mac trying to hold on all throughout circles, but we now know that ultimately, he just couldn't. Mac Miller's career wasn't even a decade long. Really, he was only in the public eye for about eight years. But by the time he passed, he had made countless projects, even some I couldn't mention here, all full of incredible music and some really beautiful messages on how life should be lived and what it's all about to strive for more. But there are very few artists who are ever able to put these feelings to music in such a real way. And that's the core of why people love Mac Miller so much. Josh Berg, an engineer who worked with Mac for years, said this about him. He said, when we see vulnerability in other people, it looks like courage. In that aspect, Mac was the leader. He was the captain of a ship that made you feel comfortable to go to a place you were scared to go. He understood that really deeply. Mac Miller led millions of people through some really dark times in his own life and in ours, and he continues to do so to this day through his music. His relentless optimism in the face of some real struggles was so inspiring, and he did all of it while producing some of the best, most creative and detailed music of the decade, and it gave his audience hope. Everybody can relate to Mac Miller in some way or another because he put his whole self into his music. It would be hard not to see yourself in the songs he wrote. To go from a mixtape like Kids to an album like Circles in just eight years is an absolutely insane development. It's mind blowing. And his career was barely a decade long. He did so much in 10 years and he wasn't even close to being finished. There are countless unfinished projects and collaboration albums out there on a million hard drives scattered through the universe, probably never to be released. He said multiple times that he wanted Swimming and Circles to be a trilogy, but even beyond that, his career could have gone in many different directions. He had so much versatility with his sound, his musical talent was constantly evolving, but honestly, that just makes the music he did make and the time he did spend here that much more special. The world was a brighter place with Mac Miller in it. He was loved by fans, he was adored by musicians, his music helped and inspired millions of people, and it was truly beautiful. He was a pure soul, a beacon of kindness and honesty in the darkness of the music industry. His openness to the world is what hurt him, but it's also what made him so special. His willingness to share his darkest moments in an effort to cope with himself and inspire people who were going through similar struggles, that's what made him one of the greatest artists to have ever lived. His journey and his story is truly the journey and story of every person. It's just that he was so creative, so sensitive, and truly felt it in a way that most people don't. And that's a huge reason why he was able to be so creative and reach so many people but also, tragically, a big part of why he's no longer here. Mac Miller's experiences, his struggles, his optimism, his spirit as a person, 
He was able to tap into his creativity in a way very few people ever could, and he made his struggle mean something in a way that helps all of us deal with our burdens and keep moving forward. And because of that, he's truly one of the great musicians of our time. And that's also why I started this channel, as a way to make art mean something. All of the artists we look up to, they've changed the world in some way, but they all have one thing in common. They had to take the first leap and push forward through doubt and uncertainty to become who they are now. Mac Miller, SZA, Kendrick Lamar, they all had to believe. And that's something that doesn't get talked about enough these days. So often today we talk about artist success after it actually happened, but we almost always forget what it took to get there. But the first drop from my new brand is called The Spirit of Creativity. And it tells the story of every artist, student, entrepreneurs, creators. It's a beautiful bird that flies through a dark night sky with silver stars. And it tells a story about always moving forward. It represents the idea of working hard to achieve your goals, even when it feels impossible to keep going, because that's when it matters. Creativity and art isn't easy. So I wanna motivate all of you to pursue your own dreams and never give up and the spirit of creativity is designed to do that. By wearing this every day, I'm reminded that the only thing crazier than chasing your dreams is not chasing your dreams. So if you wanna support my new project and get a piece of high quality, beautiful silver jewelry that represents something real, go to volksgeist.store right now and buy the spirit of creativity. For the next week only, the necklaces will be $10 off, and as always, all orders in the US get free shipping with a silver chain included. That's volksgeist.store to buy the spirit of creativity right now. Also, if you watch this far, you can use the code VOLKSGANG for a special Christmas discount.